if you can give us a sense of how long you think the recession will last. I know you said that uh, a V-shaped recovery is highly unlikely, and I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. But others have talked about a U-shaped recovery, others have talked about a W-shaped recovery, others have talked about L-shaped. Where do you stand in this spectrum? Well, I would say that we are faced with uh, unprecedented level of uncertainty, far more than what we've seen even during the global financial crisis or the Asian financial crisis. So I don't think um, whatever the shape of that recovery will look like, it is anybody's guess. I don't think there is a good basis for saying that it will be this way or that way. And the reason is that um, we are seeing both a very deep cyclical shock and the cyclical shock that is on both the demand side and the supply side, as well as accelerating structural changes. So if you take uh, the cyclical shock, for instance, I mean, never before has global demand fallen so sharply across so many sectors all at once. And similarly, supply chain, which was already being disrupted because of the US-China uh, strategic competition, is now changing as well because people are now putting a greater value on resilience. They are putting a greater value on reliability. So how will that change the global supply chain? I don't think it is uh, possible at this stage to say what it will look like, but I think it is fair to say that we are likely to see a greater move towards a certain degree of self-sufficiency, particularly for essential goods. We're likely to see probably greater regional cooperation where within the region, if you have like-minded uh, partners, you could create a more resilient structure. So the, the shock itself will trigger a set of changes. And these changes will be built on the structural changes which are already happening. So for instance, digitalization is one uh, good example. Already the digital economy was marching steadily. COVID-19 has just accelerated that much. So how soon would it recover? I think it depends very much on uh, two things. One is the recovery of the demand and supply side in the immediate. And second, how, that, how countries are going to cope with this very significant and accelerated structural changes. Do you see any green shoots of recovery at this point? Well, I think there will be growth sectors. Uh, so if you look, for instance, even within Singapore, although we are so uh, globally connected, the sectors which are still doing well are sectors like uh, MedTech, there are sectors like um, that, that cater to uh, the special needs of people. The one great relief is that supply of essential items of food, for instance, uh, globally, uh, has not been as disrupted as I had feared. So I think there are uh, some positives uh, out of this. And the other positive is that I think people are beginning to look at telecom telecommuting, for instance, quite differently. People are looking at air travel quite differently. So there are some developments which eventually will also be good for sustainable development. So I think we are also accelerating development towards a sustainable development goal. Where I think the, uh, the need to cut our carbon footprint is going to be uh, more important. And people are beginning to realise that, well, there are measures that we can take that does not disrupt the economy, that does not disrupt life as much. Uh, DPM, you mentioned structural change. Yes. Um, what are the main structural changes that you see coming or see already happening? And which are the most vulnerable sectors to these changes and which are less vulnerable? Well, one major structural change is going to be in the area of technology and uh, innovation. If the, if the COVID has forced companies and economies all over the world to look at uh, the 
e-word much more, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's uh, telecommuting, whether it's the, you know, the digital economy. So the, it changes the way we live, the way we work, and uh, the way, even the way we buy things. So I think the, uh, that is going to be accelerated. And the other is, uh, if you look at the areas of technology that are going to be important, I think healthcare uh, and the whole area of uh, developments relating to vaccines, relating to biologics, relating to medical technology uh, will become uh, more significant. And when you couple that with developments that are already taking place, for instance, on telemedicine, I think the, that will be a significant set of uh, structural changes. And that will also sh uh, reshape jobs, and we can talk about that later. So that's one significant change. The other structural change is globalization, the shape of globalization. Now, the old uh, Ricardian model, the traditional Ricardian model, rather, of you know, com comparative advantage, and that uh, the you know, England produces uh, uh, lamb and Portugal produces wine, and you can trade, and, and both parties benefit more. I think that has served the world extremely well over the last 200 years or more, in fact, over the centuries when people trade. But with uh, digitalization, with the digital economy covering every part of the world, and with the value that people are going to place on resilience, I think a new pattern of globalization will emerge. A new pattern of globalization that places a premium not just on pure efficiency and pure productivity, but rather on resilience and also on equity. So I think uh, this it will reshape globalization in ways which we are only beginning to see the broad contours of it. But how that will be, how that will exactly play out uh, will depend critically on the politics in many countries. Because you cannot have a globalization process where big segments of the population feel that they have been left out, that their lives have not become better. And the politics that you're seeing in many of the advanced economy, uh, I think is a warning to all of us on how those uh, changes are going to fracture society and fracture the support for a better specialization of labor globally. And I think countries that can manage that change better are countries that take care of their people and prepare their people well for change. Because we cannot see change in the abstract and say, well, let's change. At the end of it, change means every one of us, you and I, will have to do things differently. And habits are very hard to change, and that's going to be the hard part. But we must all try. So globalization will change, and uh, will there be de deglobalizations? I think there will be some elements of that. Will there be a fragmentation of the global supply chain? I think that's quite likely. Now, whether it will be a complete break I don't think so, because I think the cost will be extremely high for all parties involved. And if you look at the agreements that we have with like-minded countries to keep the security of supply, I think this is a, is a good positive example of how in the midst of all these major global forces, like-minded countries can come together and uh, agree to support one another. And both parties, like trade, you know, will benefit each other. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can do a lot more of that. So the shape of global. Um, the third uh, major change I think that will take place will be about the future of work. Be, because the already AI and you know robots, people were fearing robots and robots taking on routine jobs. I believe that the robotic revolution will continue. But when you couple globalization with digitalization, it changes labor market in a fundamentally uh, different way. Because it used to be that when you have trade, trading goods 
essentially allow for specializations in the factories. But now I think we are going to have significant trade in services. And services is essentially a lot of it. There, there are two types of services. Uh, one which is more high touch services. You know, for instance, uh, uh, when we go to a, a retail store and you ask the salesperson for some advice, then that is very high touch, high contact type of services. Or when you go to a restaurant, or when you travel as a tour group, it's very high touch. But there are also a class of services which are much more um, skills intensive. You know, usually the, a sort of white collar type, the managerial professional jobs. Now, both are going to be greatly affected by this change that are coming. So if you look at, for instance, service, high-end services jobs, now with AI, you can read reams of documents much faster and come out with algorithms that can make decisions on many of this. I believe that that level of uh, digitalization will continue. And in fact, uh, we are going to see significant changes in the services economy. But at the same time, you see the rise of the gig economy. Now, this has been very empowering for many people, especially in developing countries. We have seen uh, cases where people in very poor countries, who, when they have digital access, they can learn things on their own. And once they learn some of this, once they have the basic education, they are then able to make full use of their creativity, full use of their brain power, uh, to complement uh, machines, and to be able to, job can be outsourced you know, in ways which were not possible before. And jobs will be reshot in ways which were not possible before. So you are going to see a significant reconfiguration of the labour market globally, both reshoring of jobs, onshoring of jobs, outsourcing of jobs, the rise of the gig economy, of the freelancers. And this will cause significant stresses in many societies. If you look at the gig economy, for instance, just to share with you an example, I, during when we uh, had the new rules on the personal mobility devices, about 50 of my residents in Tampines came uh, to see me at my Meet the People session. I learned a lot from them on the, why they were involved in the food delivery, uh, what they had been doing. Some were doing it full-time, some were doing it part-time, and that that flexibility has brought in additional income in ways which were not possible before. Now, in turn, I spoke to some restaurant owners. Some restaurant owners, I met one restaurant owner who, was, who operated in a small stand in uh, one of our coffee shops, uh, or rather a store owner. Right? He operates a small little store in one of our coffee shops, and the couple was selling vegetarian food. So I said, oh, my sales has gone up so much because before that, people could only come to eat uh, in this little place. So I, my catchment is only this little neighborhood. Now with the uh, PMD, the, I have sales all over Tampines and my sales has been really good. Now, what is the implication of that? The implication of that is that for consumers' point of view, it's great because it means greater variety. From the storeholder, if you are, are very good in what you do, it's great because your sales will be not only throughout Tampines, but throughout, it could be throughout Singapore. Uh, during the circuit breaker, I went to, uh, I, I ordered some food from uh, a, my favorite Peranakan restaurant, and they decided to make it easier, I would just go and pick it up myself and have a chat with the owner. So I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing all right, I'm doing all right. I was very surprised because yeah. the restaurant was closed. He said, oh, I'm, I said, well, it's very good that I saw you sending a little notice about you know, your food and asking people to order, and that prompted me to come and support you. And he said, yes, yes, we have been working diligently to distribute these uh, leaflets 
in different parts of Singapore and even on the E uh, means. And uh, do you know that I'm delivering to Changni? Yeah. I said, you're kidding me. Where, you is, said, your, where is your restaurant? Your that, that restaurant is uh, around Bukit Timah. Oh, okay. okay. So I said, you're kidding. You're delivering to Changni. He said, yes. He said, for the first time, you know, the, the restaurant is delivering uh, to Changni. So I said, wow, this is going to be a big change. But he is, is a very good restaurant, so in you know, a very good Peranakan restaurant. So I was, quite, uh, I was really quite glad for him. But it shows that not just domestically within Singapore, but globally, you're going to see significant changes. And how will, she, how will jobs be reshaped? Uh, one example will be that when you think about jobs in the services economy, whether it is um, retail, F&B, with digitalization, with the fear of clustering, you are going to see a new model evolving, a model that is more resilient, a model that is more, um, more resilient to COVID-19 and other possible you know, mutations of the virus, a model that is more resilient to disruption in supply chain because of politics. But at the same time, I think we've, you are, we are going to see also a larger num number of uh, people participating in a global market, in a global labor market. Because if I'm a, 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 a poor person in a developing country, but has the right skills, I can now do a number of things digitally yeah. and add value that way. So our worth as a worker is no longer defined by just the job we do, but rather by the skills and value add that we can create. And this is going to be very, very important for every one of us to upskill, to reskill, because it will be a very different world. And I'm glad that we started our industry transformation, we started our skills future work uh, very much earlier. Uh, so I, I am optimistic that if we pull together, we can not only overcome this crisis, but we can emerge stronger. And the reason why we have to pull together is that we cannot be looking at jobs in isolation. I still believe that organizations that can bring people together will be stronger. Whether you're bringing people together fiscally in one space to do things, or you're bringing together people uh, digitally in one space, or you're bringing your suppliers and customers together digitally, all these are different modes of bringing people together. But that partnership, that collaboration, that new economic model will be significant in the future. And I believe Singapore has what it takes to make a leap to this new model quickly and allow our people to continue to have good jobs. Uh, talking of jobs, uh, DPM, you mentioned that up to or more than 100,000 jobs could be lost yes. this, this year, yes. right? Which is bigger than in SARS or bigger than in the global financial crisis. Yes. So which, which categories of workers will be the most vulnerable to these job losses? Well, the, the most immediate uh, ones are the ones which are directly hit by COVID-19. So anything to do with aviation, tourism, uh, to some extent FMB and to some extent uh, retail, uh, all those uh, will be down. And that is the reason why in a job support scheme we provided a significantly higher level of support, you know, 75, 50%. The, so I think those that involve a degree of high touch uh, will be badly hit by COVID-19. And what will be the shape of those jobs in the coming years? I think we have to start thinking hard about it because I don't think uh, global travel and global tourism will just bounce back that way. I'm looking with great interest to see how this opening up in summer uh, in Europe uh, will change the shape of the pandemic. I am, I'm hoping that it goes well because it is a very bold experiment mm. in, in Europe 
because summer summer holiday is sacred in Europe. So the pressure to open up has been very significant. And, and we'll see. I think if it goes well, I think we'll have hope that the global aviation and tourism can recover quickly. But I think it will be realistic for us to learn to live with this COVID-19. I don't think the virus will be eliminated or overcome just like that. How long would it take? We don't know. And in turn, the trajectory of this COVID-19 pandemic will shape the trajectory of the global economy. Yeah, right. Um, your government has done a lot to protect jobs so far. You spent a lot of money on this. Now, what happens when the, the job support scheme tapers off after 10 months and you still have corporate distress? Mm -hmm. What would you do then? Would you extend the scheme or would you explore other alternatives? Well, um, and as, as you know, as part of this budget, for the first time we have such a large contingency sum, $13 billion. And uh, that is to go, uh, give us the uh, firepower to deal with unexpected developments. And uh, therefore, there are a number of options that I'm looking at as to what we can do. But uh, let me say that uh, the, as many, when I met our members of the Fiji Economy Council as well as the Singapore Business Federation, one comment which several of them made is that the government cannot be expected to shore up businesses forever. And I think that is a realistic comment. And we have to think about what will be a realistic option. And as I said, at the end of it, there's some business model that will be broken, which is why in the 42 budget, I urge businesses to really rethink their business model. Because there's, it is not just the impact of the COVID-19, but COVID-19 has accelerated a lot of structural changes which are already happening. So if we don't pivot quickly to new growth areas, many businesses will be in trouble. And therefore, our support is focus on workers. The central focus of all the four budgets is on our people, on our workers. On our people in terms of supporting them on household expenses, uh, and our people in terms of you know, first keeping the jobs for as long as possible, but at the same time, having a very strong element of traineeship and skills upgrading. And we have to prepare for the change because the structural changes will come faster than uh, we imagine. And the ones, you know, the countries and the people who are most prepared for that structural change will be far better positioned. And that is why I'm very glad that we started our industry transformations, you know, in 2016, I think. And change is very difficult. When we started that, the, there were some businesses who were in denial and said, why do we need to change? You know, what is this big thing that you are seeing? But I'm glad that more and more are coming on board. And my last meeting with uh, the Singapore Business Federation, the Future Economy Council, uh, was most encouraging to see, hear our business leader you know, leading a charge for change. The other area which I am very encouraged by is when I met a group of startups in Singapore and a group of venture capitalists. And they were investing, they, the venture capitalists were investing in new growth areas. The startups were trying out new business models. And these startups, as I mentioned in my budget speech, you know, they, their mantra has been to disrupt the world, to change the way that business is done. But this time around, COVID-19 has so disrupted the world that the startups are looking at how can I help people cope with disruption? Okay. <laughs> what are the ways in which we, we can do? And they have been very creative, which then brings me to a very important aspect of our workers' training and upgrading. Our workers will have a good future if we put a lot of emphasis on learning and learning to learn. I think our education system will have to evolve. I mean, we started it 
you know, many years back, and uh, even when I was education minister, we had lots of discussion about this. How do we help our children learn how to learn and uh, to discern truth from falsehood, to, to have that level of uh, critical thinking to deal with facts which are presented before you, and most importantly, to have a level of creativity and imagination to think of new possibilities. Because the future economy will be driven by technology and innovation. And it is, in my mind, a plus for Singapore. Because we are having a declining labour force very soon. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I look forward to having more babies in Singapore, but uh, it has been many years of effort. We have not made that big leap. But uh, with however many students that we have each year, we must educate them to the best of our ability. And at the same time, for all our workers, this emphasis on skills future, on lifelong learning, must be taken really seriously. It's no longer just about that, just about you know, a, a, a buzzword. It has to be embraced deeply by everyone. And I want to make an appeal to our leaders in our companies, that as leaders, they play the most critical role in the enabling change. Yeah. And I think what will make this learning productive is not just that people learn something, but rather they learn and put to good use. And the only way that you can learn something and put to good use is when this is aligned with the company's transformation. So that both parties, both workers and businesses, see that they are aligned in the same direction and therefore they are working towards that and create achieving that synergy. Then what you're saying is that in fact this could be a silver lining for Singapore in a way that if, if, by accelerating the automation, the digitalization, the transformation that was happening a bit too slowly. And uh, would you agree with that? Would you yes, agree? yes indeed. I would, I would say that that has to be our mental attitude, right? Mm -hmm. When something hits us, we should not just sit and moan and groan and, you know, we are in an adverse situation, but rather we should spring up and say, look, you know, this is now a time for us to accelerate change. This is a time for us to spring up and embrace the change and which can serve both the immediate needs of tackling COVID-19 and our longer term needs of the structural change because the structural changes are accelerating. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the the cost of all of this. The, the cost. Um, the government has drawn heavily on past reserves, and up more than fifty billion, yes. and uh, which, which, as you have said, is unavoidable in this exceptional crisis. But you also mentioned that we need to build our fiscal position. Yes. And so what are what are the options on the revenue side to rebuild the fiscal position and as well as reserves? Well, um, we, we did a very careful study a few years back before I announced the increase in the GST on what are the, our revenue options. And uh, there are a number of options, but I have to say that every one of those has its uh, pros and cons. So I would say that uh, for now, in terms of how do we build back these reserves, how do we strengthen our fiscal position, my key focus is on the strengthening the economy. Because if our economy bounces back faster and stronger, then revenue will grow. And uh, whether it's corporate income tax, the GST or uh, personal income tax or stamp duty. In fact, uh, already we are seeing a decline in GST and in our stamp duty because of COVID-19. People are spending less, the, uh, uh, even the buying uh, fewer properties and so on. So it already has got a, an impact. But will that recover? I think the sens sen sentiment sensitive ones uh, will when the economy bounces back. Now, what are our other measures that uh, we can take to build back the reserves? One is, of course, a big part of our reserves is in uh, I mean, a part of our reserves is in uh, land sales. So when land sales resumes, 
uh, we will be able to build back uh, some of it in the past reserve. But probably the most important part of it is our investments by GIC, Tomasic, and MES. Each of our investing entities has a clear mandate. And I am very encouraged that every one of them has been reviewing this, the investment strategy in the last few years, over the years, but we have accelerated the work in the last few years. And uh, in this period of change, I think being able to get our decisions right will make a huge difference. Just as when GIC was set up back in the, uh, in the 80s, that we, that one piece, that one policy move allowed us to build a very sizable reserves which we can tap on. So will we be able to uh, make the right moves? I hope so, but, uh, I'm, but I'm very encouraged that all our investment entities have been fully focused on, on doing this. And uh, the government does not, you know, I do not interfere in what they uh, buy or sell specifically. Uh-huh. But they, there is a, a process of uh, governance that allows us to ensure that you know, we get proper accountability. And so that has been helpful. And I think we would have to uh, continue to look at various ways in which we can make our future revenue more resilient, especially in the face of two very significant changes. One is the global competition for tax dollars. You know, the, this uh, base erosion and profit sharing is a major global development, which uh, many people are not aware of, but I think there's very intense global discussion on tax rules particularly for cross-border activities. And uh, second, our own uh, aging population, what it means is expenditure will go up, revenue will uh, come down as more and more people uh, retire. And at the same time, uh, we, I'm glad that because we are prepared early, uh, we are in a much better position to manage this. So those are major issues that we will have to continue to look at. But what I'm also glad is that our, all our ministries have taken a very careful value for money approach. We have proper audits on that. Uh, and uh, you know, the Ministry of Finance has set up this value for money uh, movements. And uh, we'll continue to scrutinize this. But at the same time, uh, in terms of longer term expenditure, it is, it is right that for some of our longer-term infrastructure projects, we must continue to build Singapore. And uh, there is, right now, global interest rates are extremely low. So in, for long-term infrastructure projects, once we are able to resume work, we should again accelerate that work and uh, make full use of this current condition to uh, accelerate some of our developments. So building Singapore and building our reserves is not just about uh, you know, the, the stack of money, but building that productive capacity for Singapore in order that our people can have a better quality of life in the years to come. You mentioned the low interest rates and building infrastructure. So it, does that suggest that Singapore might increase its borrowing for infrastructure in, in this environment? Yes, we are exploring a borrowing for longer term infrastructure, not borrowing for recurrent expenditure. Right. Yeah. The money is fungible, so you can, uh, you, can you can borrow more. And yes, but uh, more to, uh, expend, uh, to infrastructure. Yes, but I think the the governance will be uh, slightly different, because even as we borrow, uh, we want to make sure that that infrastructure project is economically justifiable. Right. Whether it brings an economic return or a social return, we got to be very clear-headed about that. It's not just because there's a pool of money that's cheap money that we build. Now, I've seen during the global financial crisis how uh, countries that got into problems were trying to spend their way out of trouble by building roads nowhere, building airports nowhere. Now, those uh, 
those would eventually have to be paid for by future generations of taxpayers, and that will not be fair. But I think future generations of taxpayers will be happy to pay for you know, better health care and, and better uh, quality of roads and airports. Yeah. Right. Uh, DPM, you mentioned the investment contribution in the context of r revenue, future revenue. Yeah. Uh, would you consider increasing the contribution from, from, for net, from the net investment side? Well, we will have to study this carefully. The, my, my approach is never to say never because uh, you would depend on this. But for now, I don't see a need because the formula has been quite robust in that we are not looking at year-to-year -year returns because otherwise, in buoyant years, we'll end up overspending mm. and in depressed years, you don't have the means to spend. So I think the, the needs of the real economy and the needs of the, and the movement in the financial markets are not perfectly correlated. And in fact, during this crisis, you already see that the financial markets have recovered much faster than the real economy. Some people think that it is over-optimism. Some people think that the financial markets know more about the real economy what than do you think, people. What do you think of that issue? I, I think that we are in a situation where you have negative rates all over the world, mm -hmm. and therefore there is a scramble you know, in a search for you, and the markets are moving up because of that. But at the end of the day, financial markets cannot defy gravity. Mm -hmm. It has to be linked back to the real economy. And if the real economy is going to be in a doldrum for a while, I don't think uh, markets can remain buoyant and get detached. And in turn, how the real economy performs depends on the trajectory of the uh, pandemic. Right. And which is why I think that global cooperation, whether to find a vaccine or to find new therapeutics in order to combat COVID-19, is probably the most important thing that people around the world and, and the governments around the world can do in order for us to then fight all the other fronts. Yeah. Uh, DPM, in your wrap-up speech, you put a lot of emphasis on social capital. Yes. And, uh, uh, well, you refer to the fact that we have deep social capital assets. We have uh, our community, community grassroots organizations. We have our volunteers. We have our tripartism. So what, what role do you think the social capital has played during this managing this COVID crisis? And do you think it could be strengthened further? Oh, uh, absolutely. So first, I, I really want to, I, I'm very, very encouraged by the way that Singaporeans have uh, responded to this crisis. They have responded first and foremost, in observing these precautionary measures seriously. When we talk about you know, getting uh, members of the public to wear masks, uh, getting, adopting social distancing and so on, people have been uh, observing this very carefully. And I think that stems from the, a certain discipline in our people and also a certain trust that when our health authorities say this, it is, it is uh, an advice to be taken seriously. Uh, at the same time, I think what I'm also very encouraged by is that people are responding to uh, changes, even changes in uh, the advice that have been given uh, rather well. Of course, y you will always have a few who would you know, not obey the wearing of masks or who will have not obey the social distancing and for which enforcement action has been taken. But on the whole, it has been good. The, and I said that even they have responded well to changes because, for instance, at the start of the uh, pandemic, the idea of you know, asymptomatic patients and asymptomatic transmission, that asymptomatic patients could transmit the virus, was not uh, known even in the medical community. It is only after lots of work have been done and the world is learning on the go about dealing with this virus. And as the evidence came in, the Ministry of Health and the MTF uh, changed their advice that 
please wear a mask because you, you protect others in case you are an asymptomatic patient and you are also protecting yourself. And uh, so that has been very valuable. So I would say that uh, I think our, the uh, um, willingness of our people to sort of change as the conditions change is a very important quality for us to be able to manage this fast-moving situation. And I would add that so far, there's no evidence that the virus is mutating. But if the virus starts mutating and you have new variants that present a very different form, then I'm quite certain that the way that we deal with it and the way that each of us is advised on how to deal with it will also change. So I'm hoping that it will not come to that. Uh, there's no evidence of mutation as yet, even though there are variants of the virus. But in terms of his impact on the human body and the way that our medical community is dealing with it, uh, what we have now remains valid. So that's helpful. So that's one aspect of it, our people. The other is how our people have come together. I was at, we had many volunteers during the first distribution of masks. I, I went to thank my volunteers in, uh, in, in, one, in one area. Then there was a resident who came down. So I thought he was coming to collect a mask. And he said, I bought it earlier. I don't need any of this. Please keep it so that give it to those who need it more. So I think that civic mindedness of our people is very commendable. And, and there are many of such examples. And I thought there are also many, for instance, our civil generation ambassadors who have been uh, calling up our uh, pioneer generation and medical generation. They, because they have visited them earlier, they know who among those were living alone. Mm -hmm. And I think the having that uh, phone call to ask how they were getting on has been most helpful. I spoke to some of our civil generation ambassadors and I said, so wh what did our seniors tell you? They said, well, many of them felt very lonely because you, know, you are confined at home during the circuit breaker. And uh, so they ended up speaking uh, for a fairly long period with them. But I said, well, thank you very much for doing that. And we have many people who are doing that. We have uh, people in the national care hotlines many volunteers, including uh, psychologists and you know, volunteer workers who uh, man these hotlines voluntarily and they're doing this to provide support. So I think that is a, a strength in our society which we must uh, nurture and recognize, which we must recognize and nurture. Now, beyond that, uh, beyond the community, I will also say that uh, Many of the business leaders I met uh, have also been very conscious that the job support scheme has been given by the government to help them keep their workers. So they take effort uh, to keep their workers, and I want to thank them for that. Our trade unions, NTUC, has also been keeping in touch, the union leaders and uh, uh, our leaders in the NTUC, Chi Ming and his team of people, have also been very focused on helping our workers. And the workers have a variety of needs, and I'm glad that that care network that the NTUC has is also uh, put into action. The care network in our People's Association among our grassroots volunteers have been uh, working very well. And of course, the care network among our so social services agencies. As I mentioned before, Ministers uh, Grace Fu and uh, uh, Indrani and Desmond join me for a dialogue with leaders of some of our social services agencies. So they are looking after people from seniors to those persons with disabilities and persons with uh, special needs. And in this period, it's actually very stressful for them because if you have a person with special needs, it is not so easy to just provide support or counselling digitally. But yet, every one of them was trying. And I remember one of them telling me, he said, 
this is not as good as being able to touch and feel somebody and you know to see someone in the eye but this is at least with this digital means I can see that person on the screen the person can see me on the screen it provides a level of connection that uh, would otherwise not be there. So a phone call is better than no phone call, and a video call is better than a phone call, okay. and the face-to-face -face is the best. But they are all adapting, and I'm very glad that uh, we have so many volunteers who are working hard at, at this, and I really want to uh, uh, thank all of them that this is the social reserves I talk about. Now, the other area is our frontline officers. The, uh, I, I spoke to a number of our doctors. In fact, uh, doctors in uh, uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital who was taking care of me earlier uh, when I was down. And I wanted to make sure that you know, they were uh, coping well. So I had a, a first-hand view of what was happening. And they were really working very, very hard. And it has been very tough, but yet they, they have all persisted. So our Frontline healthcare workers, doctor, nurses, therapists, uh, have been uh, uh, have been wonderful. So, I that's why I say that it's not just the fiscal reserves that we have, but the so social reserves. You know, what who we are as a people, the values that we hold as a people, you know, the attitude, the care and support we provide for one another, and that mental attitude of being resilient, of you know having that fortitude to bounce back. Yeah. I think these are qualities that will serve uh, Singapore and Singaporeans very well in the future. So we have gone through a very big stress test and I hope that the stress test makes us even stronger. Okay, okay so, uh, my final question is on politics. So um, DPM, you mentioned in your wrap-up speech that all around the world, during this crisis, there's been a flight to leadership, mm -hmm. right? So how might this translate uh, in terms of a mandate for your government? Well, I, I think the, we will have to uh, let Singaporeans decide. But I think beyond uh, the election, the really critical issue for all of us is how do we bring our society together to cope with this period of massive changes? You have a sudden shock that has shocked the system significantly and across many fronts. The healthcare front, so that we have to find new ways to protect life. The economic front, because the economy has been so dampened by, by this COVID-19, and as well as the geopolitical front. In fact, geopolitics has not become less pronounced, but in fact more pronounced. And I'm rather concerned that you know, we are not having the global leadership to deal with this. And I do think that multilateral institutions, whether it's the WHO, the IMF, or the World Bank, or regional banks like the ADB uh, and the AIB uh, will have to rethink their roles and to see what can do in order to bring parties together. What we are seeing now is you know, different groups of people starting, like-minded countries coming together and say, let's better band together and uh, pursue our agenda. So I think there are a number of significant changes that are going on. We have to deal with a global front we have to deal with our economic front, we have to deal with our social front. So the election is really about direction setting. I see that it's not just this one election, but I see significant changes that we need to make, significant challenges that we need to uh, overcome, and significant opportunities, not in the next three to six months, but in the next five to ten years. These are changes that will define Singapore in the future. So if COVID-19 is a test of a generation, the next five to ten years will be a test of how our generation 
overcome this test of a generation and emerge stronger. So I would say that uh, beyond uh, you know, party politics and, and, and elections, really I hope that Singaporeans will focus on this one issue. How do we stay together as one people? And in that regard, I, I must uh, uh, you know, commend Mr. Pritam Singh for saying in Parliament that partisan politics uh, should take a back seat, that we should have a unity of purpose. And uh, I, th I think that that is good you know, for, a responsible, uh, for a party to be responsible and take that view. Unfortunately, it's not the case for all parties because there are parties that are looking at, well, look, you know, this thing was not well done, that thing was not well done, and so on. This is a government that has uh, not done well in this. Now, there is a time and place to uh, look back and see what can be done. But right now, you are in the midst of a major battle, a major battle on many fronts. And all our people and all our leaders in every segment of our society must first and foremost look forward. What is ahead of us? What are the dangers in front of us? What are the opportunities in front of us? Let us focus our minds on the coming months and uh, days and months and the future. You know? Now, there is value in looking back if we say, well, is there something positive that uh, is that something that we can do better that will aid us in this forward movement? But it is not a time to do uh, uh, accounting and uh, fault finding because I think that is, to me, uh, a distraction from what you need to do going forward. And for that reason, I say I welcome any good suggestions about how we might do better in, in this better. I'm very open to good ideas. You know my style. I, as I started the uh, Singapore Conversations, and uh, we have just uh, we have launched Singapore Together, and this is a COVID nineteen is an important occasion for us to reinforce Singapore Together, and so if you said we should really go look beyond this, but really about the future of Singapore. Yeah. How the Singapore come together to build the future of Singapore and to uh, rebuild structures which has been damaged by this gale force wind. Sure. Thank you, DPM. Thank you for making the time for this interview. Thank you. Thank you.